we want to share any of the floors. Um, so with that, I would like to ever talk about the back to the radio first. Um, next. Okay, great. So I should just take it over. And my two sort of uh, research interests are vast radio bursts and magnetism, so this talk is the crossroads between those two. So here I'll talk about how we can cope with the origins and foregrounds of mass radio bursts using their polarization properties. So I always like to start these talks by showing you what an FRB in our data actually looks like. So this is a waterfall plot with frequency on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. Sort of swept across thing in the middle, that's the FRB. The reason it looks like this is because the FRB signal travels through a bunch of plasma before it gets to Earth. In that plasma, it gets dispersed, and the lower frequencies get more dispersed than the higher frequencies, leading to a sort of dispersive sweep. So the reason FRBs were really interesting when they were first discovered in 2007 was because the amount of dispersion we were seeing in them was way higher than we expected to see from our own Milky Way. And so it was the first time we were seeing coherent radio bursts from outside of our galaxy. And so for a quick a uh, summary of what fast radio bursts are, they're usually micro to millisecond in duration radio bursts from cosmological distances. Then going down to the history of FRBs, a very brief history, um, in 2016 we discovered the first repeating FRB. And the reason that was important is because FRBs are really highly energetic, so a lot of the theoretical work that went into trying to figure out what they were early on um, led people to things like supernova. But if you have a repeating source, you can't destroy the object that's producing the FRB. So you need some sort of method where you can have, you know, like a black hole magnet or something that produces FRBs over days to years. So now we have 4,000 FRBs, and roughly 3% of them are repeating. Then going to 2020 was the first time we actually associated an FRB with a known magnet in our own galaxy. So this was the first time and only time where we have direct observational evidence of the progenitor source that created an FRB. And so since 2020, people have really started focusing on magnetars as the source of all FRBs, but it's not quite clear because there are so many different types of FRBs that magnetars can produce all of the different varieties. Then the other interesting thing about FRBs is their propagation shock. So you get some radio signal that's the FRB produced in some other host galaxy and travels through that galaxy through the intergalactic medium, into the Milky Way, and even down through the ionosphere of the Earth. And each of those distorts the FRB signal in a different way. One of those is dispersion. So dispersion traces the total electron density in all of these different regions where the FRB passed through before it got to us. And so that's really useful if you want to study like the density of the intergalactic medium or galaxy halos or something like that. Then FRB signals are also linearly polarized. So you get this polarization angle on the planet sky that as it passes through magnetized and ionized plasma, it rotates as a function of frequency. So we can measure that in our telescope, and then that tells us not only the density of all of these different components along the line of sight, but also the magnetic field strength in those components. So all of that to say FRBs are really useful tools where you can play these fun games, that you use FRBs as backlights for different structures in the universe that you could then measure. Okay, so that naturally leads to these two main branches of FRB science. There's one group of people who was really interested in the origins and progenitors of FRBs, asking questions like what objects create them or what are the emission mechanisms that are involved. Then there's another group of people who don't really care where they come from. All they really care about is using those FRBs to study something about the universe itself. So things like big questions like what is the baryon separation in the universe? Like how many baryons are in the IGM versus in galaxies and so on. I'm part of both of these groups, but mostly in this talk I'll focus on the uh, former of four different progenitors, but I'll touch on uh, the latter in the last five minutes or so. Okay, so I work with polarization properties of FRBs, but what can that actually tell us about the FRB origins themselves? So here I'm showing you a diagram I just drew up. This is a toy model where you have some magnetar that's rotating, and then you have the FRB emission in a narrow cone that's originating somewhere close to the surface of the magnetar, so sort of like pulsar. That beam as it travels past the observer's line of sight, the exact geometry that the observer sees it changes as a function of time, and so the polarization angle that you get, 
as a function of time. This is sort of rotating vector model, which is used for pul uh, mostly pulsar observations, but applies the same in this case. Then you can have a different type of model, let's say another magnetar, but this time you get some sort of flare or ejecta. Then that travels out, interacts with material that's in the circumverse environment, you create a shock, and then the FRB is created in that shock emission. In that case, now you're emitting over a much larger region. That region isn't, isn't going to change with respect to the observer over millisecond durations. And so in this case, you would expect a constant polarization angle profile as a function of time, which is as opposed to this one, where it should be very. In terms of local environments, this one's a little bit easier if I just plop my magnetar into, let's say, a supernova remnant. That supernova remnant is very dense, it's highly magnetized, so when I observe the emission that travels through that, I should expect to see high rotation measure and high magnetic field strength. And then vice versa, if I just put it in the middle of nowhere where there's nothing around it, then I expect low rotation measure and low magnetic field strength. So if this is all so easy, then why haven't people done it before? <laughs> um, they have, but not quite in a complete way. So this is the FRB, um, breakdown where we have non-repeaters, which make up 97% of the population, so they go off once and we haven't seen them again, and then we have repeaters, which are 3% of the population. Now, most conventional radio telescopes can only see those repeaters because they have a narrow field of view, so you need to know the position that you're looking at beforehand. And so for the last 17 years since FRBs are discovered, people have been doing this work, but only for the repeating FRBs, which are already the special 3% population of the entire FRB. Um, population, and so they've just extrapolated that these must be how all FRBs behave. But that's not a good assumption because repeaters are also very different from non repeaters in other ways. And so, really, what we need to do is get at this 97% from non repeaters. So, that's what we did. Chime is particularly good for this because it has a large field of view, and so it is one of the best telescopes, if not the best in the world, at detecting these non repeating FRBs. Um, and earlier, or last year now, I guess, I looked at 128 um, non-repeating FRBs and their polarization properties, which more than doubles all of the collective polarization information we had on FRBs in the last 17 years. And so this will be a just high-level highlights of that paper. So first we asked the question of what can we tell about the emission mechanisms from our data? Well, here is um, the polarization angle as a function time for a bunch of different FRBs, but really the important panels are the top and the third one. From those, we see that roughly 80% or so of the FRBs have these constant profiles as a function of time, which, if you remember, means that they usually favor emission models that are farther from the magnetar surface, so something like a shock model. But there's already an exception to this rule. So this is another FRB detected by time, and if you look at the polarization profile at the top, you can see that it almost exactly resembles what a rotating vector model looks like. And so in this case, we would interpret that to mean that it's coming from very close to a magnetar surface. And so already we're starting to see diversity in the types of emission physics that can create FRBs. Okay, then we looked at the local environment. So this is a plot showing the rotation measure contributed from the host galaxy of the FRB. So basically how dense and how magnetized is the stuff around the FRB. In the middle, I shaded a region that's typically, it's what you would expect if the FRB was placed in a Milky Way-like galaxy, basically. And most of our FRBs fall into that category. But there are FRBs in this top end, which are more consistent with a sort of dense nebular origin, so something like a supernova remnant or a pulsar or magnetar wind nebula surrounding it. And then you get these FRBs on the low end, which are candidates for FRBs in sort of clean environments, where there's not a lot of stuff around them and weak magnetic fields. So for example, we know an FRB that exists in a globular cluster, and so these FRBs can be candidates for something like that. Again, now we see not only diversity in emission physics, but also local environments of FRBs. And this isn't even to mention some of the repeating FRBs, which are far off this plot in this direction, um, at an order of magnitude or higher rotation measure. Then what I think is the most exciting result from this work is looking at the magnetic field strength um, of non-repeating FRBs, which are in red, and repeating FRBs, which are in blue. And we find there's some evidence to su uh, suggest that repeating FRBs originate in more highly magnetized environments than non-repeating FRBs. So now you don't just have a diversity, you have potentially a dichotomy in the types of environments that form FRBs. But this is still pretty tentative. The main things we need to do is get way more FRBs, which already on it. The second polarization catalog will have 2,000 FRBs instead of 128, and that's currently being processed. 
Um, and then also, as mentioned by Juan and Matias earlier on this year in uh, their tasty talks, we also have the China Tropic Outriggers coming on, and all three should be operational this year. Thank you, Matias. <laughs> um, and with that, we'll be able to fold in information about the host galaxies and the redshifts of all of these FRBs. Okay. Now I'll talk a little bit about how we can use FRBs to program more graph structures. So what I've been thinking about a lot recently is how can we use FRBs to study the intergalactic medium and try to answer this question of the origins of cosmic magnetism. So we have magnetic fields, we know that, but where did they come from and how did they evolve to where they currently are? And so there's different theories, like maybe there was a dynamo in galaxies that um, grew these magnetic fields from a small seed field, Maybe you have these outflows like supernovas or AGN really driving this evolution, but the main sort of distinguishing factor in a lot of those theories is how magnetizes the intergalactic medium as a function of redshift. And that's something you can directly measure with FRBs. But we're not quite there yet. We need two steps to get there. We need number one, to find FRBs in clean environments, because otherwise that signal from the host galaxy will wash out any signal from the IGF. But to do that, then you need a good model for the Milky Way's foreground contributions, because otherwise any error that you have in this model will propagate into your uncertainty of determining what the host environment looks like. So really what we want is these FRBs in this bottom part of this plot. But what we're stuck with is that there's a large uncertainty on the galactic rotation measure. So we don't really know what it looks like on small scale. So let me show you what I mean. So this is the plot of the galactic rotation measures guide. It looks beautiful. I know who made it, so I don't want to speak ill of him, but <laughs> the data that's underlying this is a little problematic. So it's only one polarized source per square tree, so any angular um, scales below that, we don't actually know what the rotation measure looks like. And also there's large statistical uncertainties even when you move away from the galactic plane, and those will directly propagate into your uncertainty on what the host environment looks like. And here I really zoomed in to show you my point, which is this is the localization region of an FRB, which is an arc minute um, in radius. And as you can see in this map, there really is no scales on these structures at all. So we're averaging over much larger regions than what we know our FRBs are. And so that will also add an inherent uncertainty into our measurement. So in 2023, I led a BLA observing campaign where we basically took eight FRBs that are known and we observed a dense grid of polarized radio galaxies around them so that we can use those to better measure the galactic rotation measure on small scales. And these grids are about 10 to 30 times more dense than the grids used to make the small sky map. So we used a statistical region instruction that was developed and tested by an undergraduate student, Afan Kadir, right over there. <laughs> um, and with this, we basically created these before and after plots. So in the top one, you can see the before image, which is the all sky map that I showed you. And then this sort of middle plot is where we've added our VLA data, rerun the statistical reconstruction, and now we derive a lot of the small scale structure that we weren't seeing before. That gives us a better estimate at the galactic rotation measure towards the FRB, but also it has much lower uncertainties as well. And so it really breaks that bottleneck, and we can actually find which FRBs are in clean environments. And so really the takeaway is that these are the most accurate measurements of the host magneto ionic environments of FRBs to date. But the long-term goal of this is now we'll have large FRB surveys, we'll have large all-sky radio surveys that measure polarization. So you could do this for every single FRB you detect in like five to 10 years. And so really the goal is to build up the subset that are in clean environments so that you can directly test the origins of cosmic magnetism. Okay, so with that, I filled your brain with magnetic field, so I will give you a break and a few questions. Just on the left plot, when you had the uh, rotation measures, how are you dealing with potential Faraday complexity? Are you just taking the largest peak, or are you taking a way to meet of peaks? Yeah, so we um, remove any sources that we saw to clearly resolve peaks, and then any that were sort of blended or at one peak, we uh, inflated its uncertainty so that it downweights it effectively through reconstruction. Yeah. From the sample, you know roughly the experiments you had, what's the rate at which we detect an FRB that's over a thousand uh, radians per square? Um, just based on what we processing data <laughs> in the time back end, I would say maybe like a few a year. Yeah. Okay. 
um, if you can go back to that one that showed a really nice uh, swing. It's, uh, I was wondering, part of that, that one has actually lasts, seems quite long, but I mean, like, like, the, the time scale usually changes between what yeah. people plot. So, is some of them, are they just so short that even if they had a swing like that, you couldn't see it? Or is it, or are there lots of other sources where you see no swing that are also like, I guess, two milliseconds in duration? So, no, so, so this one is actually shorter than some of the other ones we so see. Short, okay. Yeah, so it's, really, so, it's really unusual. Yeah, and our time resolution is like 2.56 yeah. microseconds. So, we should be able to see it as long as there's enough signal noise, basically. Yeah. So, sure. it truly yeah. is a physical. This, yeah. this one is unusual. Not, yeah. not like the, the noise. There are some concerns that I have because time is at lower frequencies that maybe it's we're seeing a higher fraction of flat polarization angle profiles because they're more scattered and that sort of flattens the yeah. profiles. But I've tried to test that and I haven't seen clear evidence of that yet. So I think this is visible. Cool. Thank you. How do you choose what time you're measuring? Like it's from zero and how positive maybe? For the swing. Um, so these are all just in the plots, they're normalized. The, the average is the zero angle, but it's when you detect the FRB, you get a trigger that says save data in this time regime, and so it's usually like plus or minus a few milliseconds around the FRB that you save data for. Yeah. At this point, do we have enough information to say that um, you know the things that we see as repeaters are not strongly represented within the things that look like non-repeaters. Yeah, I think so. so. This one has a sling, but this is an unusual non-repeater in that sense. Yeah, so I think we do in terms of like birth morphology, like their duration and their bandwidth is different from non-repeaters. Um, now we have some evidence that also their local environments are different. And so it does, I think I'm leaning towards the camp that they're two physically distinct things. Specifically two, it's not just a parameter space which is well there's gonna be some overlap there because at some point you're limited by the exposure time that your telescope has on the sky so something could repeat but maybe over like 10 years and we just haven't seen it yet but there's you know those repeating FRBs that go off like that one sometimes an hour and then ones that go off maybe once a year so there's like very clearly even in the repeater regime like a large gradient in uh, 